to start this one, we're going to go up to the flagpole, uh, but you may have been able to read the history. Pam made a nice summary of the history in that handout uh, about how the whole thing originated. But it does not mention that there were graves originally before 1800 because Jonathan Middlebrook, who originally gave the land to the church in 1818, had a private burial ground. It was called Joe's Hill. And he had buried some mainly congregational church members before 1800 in that area. Because when I look at the old gravestones, which are hard to read, I found a few before 1800. And then Jonathan Middlebrook is there, along with about a dozen Revolutionary War veterans, which is an interesting part of the old section to look up who these people were and what they did in the Revolutionary War. And then the cemetery grew because the part we're standing on here was owned by a man named Betts, who gave uh, a portion of it to the church in the, the mid-1800s, about 1853, I think it's on that sheet. And then by 1918, the rest of it uh, was given to the Congregational Church of this, of this older part. And then, in the 1900s, there had been an old house and a barn down on the property between here and the uh, children's uh, school area. And the house burned down. The Gregory family bought the property. Four and a half more acres were added in the 1930s. And then in 1950, Charles Dana, who was a big benefactor for the Walton Church and for the Norwalk Hospital, uh, Charles Dana gave the money to buy the rest of that 25 acres from uh, the Gregory family. So they have enough land going that direction for another 200 years of burials. So we're not worried about that. <laughs> uh, and then the most recent uh, change was the cremation burial uh, area, which is down at the bottom of the hill on the main road around. And uh, Jan Tessar designed that for us. And it's a wonderful layout. You only have to buy a little thing, tiny plot big enough to put a box in and a plaque on top. And it's very nicely uh, landscaped. And it's uh, grown up a little since we did it about 12 years ago, but it still looks great. Uh, in the meantime, we'll start up at the flagpole. And and you can follow me up here. I think you can all see the flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, where we have the ceremony every year, Memorial Day. And the plaque uh, lists those who, uh, well, the people who were killed in World War I and II. Well, we only had one name from World War I on there, and that's James Whipple, who was killed in Europe, and he's buried over there. And of the other names, 10 of them, I'm sh I mean, they're a total of 12, so there are 11 other names. One of them, we're not even sure who he was, but <laughs> the 10 of them were sure of Wilton, where there were Wilton men. The last one on there, Ernest Herpen, we think he was from New Canaan, and somehow he sneaked on our side. <laughs> uh, but these are ones killed in World War II in Wilton, and about four of those are buried here in this cemetery. Uh, some of the others are buried overseas where they were killed and some other cemeteries around. Now this man, Joe Hopkins, uh, is one of our most famous people here. You might say, who the heck was Joe Hopkins? Well, he was a LST commander, uh, part of the U.S. Navy in World War II. And the LST was transferring uh, military supplies and men from the big ship to the landing areas where they were landing. And in particular at Iwo Jima, one of the huge battles, he was transferring a lot of equipment and men to the shores of Iwo Jima. And they had a huge battle to capture the mountaintop. And you all know the picture of the men raising the flag on Iwo Jima. Well, they put up a little flag wasn't big enough really to let the cameramen get a good picture of it. And so they sent a man down to Joe's ship. He was the captain of this ship. 
said, do you have a really big flag? And he said, yeah, I've got one that's eight feet long and five feet high. So they, he gave them a flag. That's the flag that's in the picture <laughs> on Iwo Jima. And he told that story in 1977. He wrote a letter to Dr. Boas, who is a longtime uh, Wilton resident and a friend. And I knew Dr. Boas and also knew Joe Hopkins a little bit. He died in 1980. Uh, he came back to live the rest of his life in Wilton. Nobody really knew that it was his flag on top of Iwo Jima until he wrote that letter to Dr. Boas, and then, of course, he got the publicity. The flag itself is in a marine museum somewhere, rather tattered because it flew for quite a while. But uh, Joe was a civil servant to some extent. He was. Uh, chairman, I think, of the Sewer Commission. So when he died in 1980, the obituary didn't even mention the Iwo Jima thing. It says, Joe Hopkins, sewer administrator, oh. dead at 80, <laughs> in 1980. So he didn't get much of an obituary either. <laughs> but uh, he's very uh, highly thought of here, that's for sure. And you'll see some of the other graves around here are the uh, men that were killed early. There's the uh, Burchard Evans grave here somewhere, Burchard Evans, who was one of the first uh, Wilton men here, killed in the war. He was killed in 1941. Actually before the war started, it was in a, a practice, a drilling exercise, and he was killed. And uh, as I said, there are four other World War II veterans here in the cemetery. But then we're gonna walk over this way and see some other famous people. If you, <coughs> that's why I carry the cane. There's some real drop-offs here. I could have dropped into his grave. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, George Abbott and his wife, Lovisa, L-O-V-I-S-A Abbott. They lived up on Hurlwood Street. <clears throat> and for those of you that are historical society members, everybody remembers Walt Smith. Well, Lovisa was Walt Smith's aunt, and she married George Abbott. And they had a, he was a blacksmith. It's another good use for this cane is to shake this crud <laughs> off of here. <laughs> lichens. The lichens love it. Yeah. Uh, Lovice, I think, was the second wife of George, and George was a blacksmith up on Hurlwood Street. He had a, a small blacksmith shop and a big red barn, and both of them are, or at least the barn is on the picture. It's in the picture on the front of the Wilton History Book. It's also the barn that's now down in back of the Historical Society, and the blacksmith shop, which was also George Abbott's blacksmith shop, is down there behind the Historical Society. Do we have a blacksmith now? Yes, we Allison? do. Good. Yes, we do. Good. It's one of the attractions when we open it up uh, is there's a blacksmith on site for those special events. We don't have one on the staff, do we? Unless you no, learned. not yet. You haven't <laughs> learned that? Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's he's kind of noteworthy, at least from a historical standpoint. Historical Society. Now we have a Middlebrook. Uh, there are a number of smaller graves. This often happens in the cemetery. They put in one big marker and they have this, the actual graves located around. James Middlebrook, who is in one of these plots, lived up, I think, for Zal. I think he lived in the house where you grew up. Yes, I think that was James Middlebrook. Yeah. And I'm not sure how it got to Al Perry, but. Anyhow, it was James Middlebrook, and he was our first uh, rural free delivery mailman. Up until 1900, you had to go to the post office to pick up your mail. And the post office service initiated RFD in 1900, and James Middlebrook was the first one. So there. Here's his, here's his individual spot, right here.
Now this cluster of graves is a number of uh, Myers and Otavis. In the early 1900s, actually up through about 1935, 1900, 1935, the major contractors in Wilton were the Meyer brothers, Charles and Fritz. And they built all the important buildings in that period and a lot of houses. And uh, they built the uh, center school, for example, which was the first real consolidated school in town. Before that, everybody went to one-room schools, mm -hmm. unless you were lucky enough to live in Georgetown. And Georgetown, thanks to the <coughs> generosity of the Gilbert and Bennett people, had a wonderful, with wonderful eight-room school with outside doors on every classroom, interior heating, mm -hmm. plumbing, electricity, a great playground, and the rest of Wilton was going to one-room schools. <laughs> Up until 1929, when the town finally got its act together and, and built the center school. And so that was the first consolidation, except for those people lucky enough to live in Georgetown. Well, I'm lucky enough now, I live up in Georgetown, but I don't go to that school because <laughs> <laughs> the building is still owned by the town of Wilton and it's uh, used as a, it's called the G&B Cultural Center and it's run by a woman named Pat Hagnar. She rents out space to artists and writers and musicians and people that want a private space to have meetings or to work in a quiet area. And it's rented out, but it's, you know, managed. Uh, it's a 501c3 if you're interested in making a donation. She also has a big display area where they sell products of the people that work there. Now the rest of this family, one of the uh, Myers, was, I think, uh, yeah, killed in World War II. Uh, a uh, sister was a victim of the flu epidemic in 1918. Mm. If you've read any of that history, we lost many more U.S. people to the <laughs> flu epidemic than we did to the war, in the First World War. The yeah. flu epidemic was just terrible. And I think Wilton lost 18 people to the flu epidemic. One of them was one of these people buried in this group. It was a member of the Meyer family. Uh, Bridget Meyer was a, an Irish girl. She came over to this country with the Schenck family. And you know about Schenck's Island. Mm -hmm. Well, the Schenck family bought the place in Wilton in about 1909, 1910 and it included a lot of land at the south end of Wilton Center, also the thing known as Shanks Island. And the family itself uh, did a lot for the town of Wilton. Uh, and the maid that they hired was Bridget. <laughs> and Bridget married Fritz Meyer. And she outlived him by quite a bit. George Washington Post. Where's Where's Karen? I think. I'm over here, Washington Post Drive. All right. She lives on Washington Post Drive. George Washington Post, nobody remembers him except Karen. And <laughs> their daughter, Angeline, Angie, was a public school teacher in Wilton for about 50 years. And anybody that grew up in Wilton in those days knew Angie Post. She was a wonderful school teacher. Most of her, at least the first 35 or 30 some years of her career was in one room schools, but she did finish up at center school in a building that he had heat and electricity. But she was a beloved teacher in Wilton, and that's why I mentioned her name. Bob, what year did she die, does it say? Uh, Angie? Does it say there? Yeah, it's a, in the 1980s, I think. Yeah. Ah. Born in 1878, died in 1979. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a great picture of uh, Ralph Pearsall when he built the, the new village market in 1965. 
and he had Angie Post and a number of other old timers all lined up and took a picture. So that, but she was a, a wonderful teacher from those who knew her. There were a lot of Raymonds. Uh, a large number of them lived in the house across from the Congregational Church that is still owned by the church. It's uh, intended to be the uh, manse for the senior minister, but I don't think our senior minister lives there at the moment. So it's rented out, right, Karen? Yes, it is rented out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the uh, Comstock family lived there quite a while. She lived to be 104. <laughs> so she, at the time, and maybe still, was one of our very oldest residents. We have older ones at Meadow Ridge, but <laughs> <laughs> this was a long time ago. Now I have to look at my map and see where we're going. I think we're going to go right behind Karen's. Look and see if Gifford Proctor is buried back there. I don't know if, if any of you remember up on Sealy Road, the big old uh, Sylvia Kaiser house is now owned by Peter Gaborio and uh, had three or four outbuildings one of which was a studio for a sculptor named Gifford Proctor. And he was working on a statue of George Washington at Valley Forge. And he worked on that statue for approximately 60 years. He produced a few other things. I'm not quite sure what he lived on all that time, but he never actually got the statue finished. And he used to push it out the back door of that red barn onto a outside area and it was, of course, not in metal at that time. It was a, a plaster statue. And he, at one point near the end of this effort, he sent it off somewhere to be cast into metal. And uh, either he didn't like what they were doing or they accidentally broke it. But it got sent back to his studio on Sealy Road and he never actually finished it. And so he died an unha unhappy man. But he lived in Wilton for a very long time. His father, Alexander Fimister Proctor, was also an artist. And he lived over on uh, Hurlbut Street. And there's a statue, a sculpture done by him in the Wilton Library. Man on a horse, beautiful metal statue done by Alexander Fimister Proctor. He's not buried here. Okay, so where did the statue go? The broken one. Uh, well, they did manage to cast a small, uh, not small, it's about eight feet high statue in a, uh, it's not paper mache, but it's not heavy metal either. They, they made a statue that survived his life, and it's, unless they've moved it, it's at Middlebrook School <laughs> in the lobby outside the auditorium at Middlebrook School. And the Historical Society has a, has a full-size um, maquette, which is in um, um, some kind of a resin material that is yeah. absolutely huge. Yeah. That was a model for the statue. Yeah. We have that. If they had ever built the full size. If they had ever built it full scale. This, yeah, it's really interesting. We have that. The easy. small size, it's the same material. Yeah, some... and we have a, a maquette also of the of it about this tall of the entire statue as yeah. well. Yeah, we do. Yeah, good. Yeah. Come and see it. <laughs> <laughs> This whole area around here has uh, members of the Schlichting family. And they owned the big old house that up until about three years ago stood next door to the north. And people asked me earlier what the status is. Well, it's kind of in limbo. The, his, the uh, Wilton Land Trust has a uh, tentative a hold on it. They've put money down to place a hold on it because the developer, Fieber, uh, died. His sons inherited the property. They had plans to develop it and the land trust and other conservation-minded people didn't want to see that happen. So the land trust was able to secure a hold on it, begin to raise money. They have a pledge for, they need 2.2 million. They have a pledge for about half of that and they're trying to get some money from the state which to me is very iffy, 
And if that doesn't happen, then the thing probably will go back to development, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the, the Carol Slichting, who was the man, Carol Slichting was the maintenance man of the cemetery here for a very long time. His wife, Annie, uh, ran the management of the cemetery. She kept all the books had meetings in the cemetery committee in her kitchen. And I know when I was uh, on the church board of trustees, I went to a couple of meetings in her kitchen. She would call the meeting to order, put a bottle of scotch in the middle of the table. <laughs> and we went on from there. <laughs> but the last person to live in there was uh, Ann Schlichting, a sister of Carol. His wife was Annie, his sister was Anne. Very confusing. And Anne Schlichting never married. She lived there all her life from 1920 to 2010 or 12. Mm -hmm. Lived into her 90s. And uh, when we interviewed people for the video that we produced for 2002, Anne Schlichting was one of the people we interviewed. And I said, you, you must remember the 1938 hurricane, the last real hurricane that hit New England and hit Connecticut. Indeed I do, she said. I was standing in the front hall and one of those big spruce trees out front just came right out. <laughs> and she said it was my 18th birthday. <laughs> but Ann uh, is a very bright lady. She worked for the village market as head cashier. And I remember, very grumpy looking serious lady. For 40 years she worked in the village market from 1941 to 1981 and some of you will probably remember that. <clears throat> but when she died the only heirs were her niece and nephew and they had been supporting her for the last few years of her life. They'd been paying the taxes, buying her food, buying, paying the caregiver and they desperately needed the money which is why it got sold. So what can you say? Now the map will show that we're going to go straight across that way because there's some other important people behind me but we did that last time and if you have time afterwards you can go up and look uh, the uh, Ed, Edward Martin who founded the original Life magazine the Degener family who originally owned Quarry Head up off of Ridgefield Road and a few others interesting people but we have to go see this Dr. Turner. And I hope you can uh, take turns and read the inscription on there. He was a pioneer in the treatment of alcoholism. And he started a, a care facility in Binghamton, New York, for men, alcoholics. And they treated, they, they attempted to cure alcoholism. They called it the inebrium. <laughs> they were inebriates, they weren't alcoholics, they were inebriates back then. Attempted to cure it in the way we would treat them today. You know, total abstinence. You tie them down if necessary, you have to have the person willing to go through this treatment because if a person doesn't want to be cured, they won't be cured. And he did the modern method of treatment of alcoholism. But the board of directors at Binghamton said, oh, these are smart people and they want a little drink before dinner and so you have to let them get something before dinner so they didn't like the seriousness of the way he had treated the inmates and so they fired him and so he came back to Wilton and fortunately his wife was a member of the Middlebrook family and you know Middlebrook Farm Road and the big house at the front end was George Middlebrook's house. And the man who founded the cemetery was Jonathan <coughs> Middlebrook. And the original Middlebrook was Michael Middlebrook. And he came to Wilton in the 1750s. And bought everything north of Wilton Center up to about Olmsted Hill Road, a huge property. And part of that ended up being Middlebrook Farm. So we have a Middlebrook School, we have Middlebrook Farm Road, etc., etc., etc. And uh, there were eight Middlebrook women, one of whom married Dr. Turner. And so he came back to town, raised money from all his brothers-in-law to build another uh, 
treatment, a sanitarium <coughs> for treatment of women huh? alcoholics. And it was going to be on top of Middlebrook Farm Road, where the Catalpa Road and Middlebrook Farm Road and Olmsted Hill has a Turner Road. We'll meet on top there. And the land was totally barren and no trees, so you could see for miles. And so he went around raising money for this huge, huge uh, hospital. And in the book, the Wilton History Book, there's a picture of it. 300 feet long, four stories tall, designed in the 1866 mode with lots of towers and uh, decorations. A beautiful building if it would have ever been built. But his enemies up in Binghamton got down to the state authorities in Hartford, in Connecticut, and said this man is a, a shyster, a crook, a thief. He doesn't know what he's doing. So they revoked his license. And so he had to refund the money that had been raised. They had actually broken ground for this huge facility, but that's as far as it got. And there's no remains of it left. The poor man came back home, which was next door here, and, and died an unhappy man. But 20 years later, the uh, American Medical Society in 1909 erected this in his memory. By the methods he instituted, thousands have been redeemed, humanity blessed, the principles of Christianity advanced. And so he was, he was at least 20 years ahead of his time. It's too bad. <laughs> so he was one of the famous people here. This uh, marker's for Ben Prynne. Uh, he was an artist that had uh, many uh, covers for Saturday Evening Post. Lived up on Ridgefield Road, right about where... Uh, uh, the park. Right yeah, right across from DeForest Road. Yeah, one of those three houses along there. And uh, I never knew him, but uh, he lived in 1980 something. Is that 1989 or 1980? 19... 1980. 1980. Yeah. This is uh, a group of Comstock. We had a lot of Comstock, and particularly, I'm interested in these three stones right here. The Comstocks had their own family cemetery up near where most of the Comstocks lived. And Rebecca will know where the Comstocks lived since I think your family still owns a house up there. Yes. <laughs> still empty house, I guess? No, people are renting it. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> uh, but that whole area where Nod Hill Road branches off of Ridgefield Road was a Comstock corner. There was a, 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 a grocery, a post office, a schoolhouse, it's actually on Nod Hill, and a lot of Comstock families. And on the other side of the road, where Signal Hill Road is, there was a barn, a blacksmith shop, something else. A lot of Comstock uh, people in that particular corner. And then there was a cemetery, which is still there. It uh, kind of faces, it's on the corner of Signal Hill Road and Ridgefield Road. And if you go by, especially in the winter, you can see the markers in the cemetery. It was their own private cemetery. But in about 18... Can I say that the DAR is supporting that cemetery and cleaning it every year? Thank you. I was going to put in a plug for the DAR, <laughs> but Ann beat me to it. <laughs> okay. I thought you were moving on. Yeah. And I have to say the Welton Land Trust owns it. It was in a series of private ownerships and I was always worried somebody would develop it. <laughs> but the Land Trust bought it and the DAR maintains it. So I think we're in good hands, as long as the DAR keeps maintaining. Yep. <laughs> but the interesting thing is they buried family members and other, there were several revolutionary veterans buried there because the cemetery started operating in the 1790 time frame. But then in about 1805, they signed a lease with the town of Wilton for some ridiculously low price, like $5. The town could bury its indigent poor. So as a result, when you walk through there, there are a lot of flagstones on edge with no names, just markers. 
and we've never dug down to see if there are any bones there, but they might be gone long ago. But there are at least 60 or 80 flagstones that don't have any markers, and there are no records, because the town didn't keep records until the 1850s or 60s. The church kept records of their members, but these people were indigent poor and the homeless, essentially. And so they had, <coughs> the town would bury them there in this Comstock Cemetery, there are quite a lot of them. And uh, that lease, I guess, ran out about 1850-something, but there were very few uh, burials beyond that. And then the Comstock family had trouble finding people in their family that were willing to maintain the cemetery. So they decided, we'll give it up, but we want to move the important people out of there. <laughs> so these three big ones, Major Samuel Comstock was one of our big leaders in the Revolutionary War. Uh, he was in active duty for seven years, all during the Revolution, and some of his careers on that stone. Uh, his brother, Strong Comstock, is down there where the flag is, and in between are their parents. That's why it's an older stone that's beginning to fall apart because these old sandstones, you know, started to chip apart. But they moved those down sometime uh, in like 1900. They left some of the old stones from this family up there in the Comstock Cemetery. So, you know, you may find a Samuel Comstock stone flat on the ground up there, but this is his real marker. And I can't tell you where the body is. <laughs> we didn't check whether they moved the body. Well, I don't know. We didn't check whether they moved the body. They claimed they did. Mary Emma Woolley died in 1947. Was president of Mount Holyoke College. Huh. And uh, had family connections in Wilton, so she's buried here. And I didn't look up any more about her, but uh, she may have been the first woman president of Mount Holyoke because even the women's schools always felt they had to have a man president. Now we're going to go look for Wilbur Morgan down here by an old stump, and then we'll go over to the old section. About 15 years ago when I did a personal inventory of the whole cemetery, I could always find Wilbur Morgan because he was next to this huge maple tree. And so when I came out recently, a year ago I guess, I couldn't find the maple tree. Well, there it is. <laughs> and Wilbur is a Civil War veteran. He's, a, he's really a casualty of Gettysburg, Wilbur Morgan. There's also a Morgan Cemetery in town up across from the Bald, not the Bald Hill, the North Wilton Fire Station. Across the road there's a Morgan Cemetery. But uh, his family chose to bury him here. He was mortally wounded at Gettysburg and came home and died here a couple of months later. So uh, he's really our, our, uh, our star uh, Civil War veteran because he's a, a victim of Gettysburg, Wilbur Morgan. And also we have some letters that he wrote. He would write letters back to his friends in Wilton. And in the Wilton History Room, there are a couple of letters written by Wilbur Morgan. And people say, who the heck was he? Well, I say he was <laughs> a Wilton man. He was in the Gettysburg battle and uh, mortally wounded and came back here to die. Okay, so now we'll go over the old section. Uh, there's a statute that allows the towns to maintain an unkept cemetery, like the one up in Branchville and, and the Morgan Cemetery and the forest and so on. Uh, but the town has to decide they want to do it. And so usually it's some private organization that will do it. Now somewhere along here we have a row of Gregory's. Maybe this one. Right? Yeah. That, you, you've been here before, Al. Yeah. Yeah. So a number of the Gregory family. This is uh, Louis Gregory, Moses Gregory, 
Uh, I know when I looked up the genealogy, one of them is Julian's great grandfather, long hair, and then the great great grandfather of the Gregory family. The uh, earliest Gregories that came to Wilton are buried down at Sharp Hill. Uh, but here's, you can, if you're interested in the Gregories, these, I think all six or seven of these are Gregory families, or eight or nine. We have a whole list of who's buried here in the old section. Uh, it's, a, you know, an extensive list, so I didn't put it all out, but I, I also put little white flags by some of them so we can find them again. Yeah, I think this is uh, Thaddeus Mead, but I can't be sure. That looks like M E A D, maybe. <laughs> but that's not Thaddeus. Maybe this is Thaddeus. <laughs> it doesn't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a an inventory that somebody did about 40 years ago of this old section, and it was probably a scout project. He numbered the rows starting up there and going the other way. Has no connection to the numbering system used in the main part of the cemetery. And he numbered the graves starting at the south end going north. So again, it had no connection to the system used in the main. And I didn't want to renumber 400 graves, so I left the old system the way it is. <laughs> and we do have a list of where they are. Enoch, E N O C H, Tuttle. Okay. He was a, you know, a Wilton man. Oh, thanks. <laughs> he was a Wilton man. He also was in a prison in New York City. There's a terrible prison that the Brits maintained, some of them on ships. And uh, a lot of people did not survive. So he was imprisoned in New York City for a while during his military career. Let's see, the next one is down there where the American flag and the little white flag. That's William Dudley, I think. William Dudley, he was in the War of 1812. We do have a few uh, victims or uh, veterans of the War of 1812. Not as many as the Revolution because the War of 1812 was not particularly popular in Connecticut. Uh, in fact, the governor at the time uh, did not allow the recruiters to come in and recruit for the War of 1812. Uh, they just thought it was a terrible thing because it cut off the trade that they enjoyed between Connecticut and Great Britain. And so there was a war, but Connecticut wasn't particularly happy about it. But this, this man served. Okay. What is that plaque that's on the gravestone? <laughs> oh, the uh, the veterans, the the uh, Wilton veterans. What is it? Is it the VFW? American Legion? Or the, is it the American, American Legion? Or American Legion. The, the American Legion is doing this. Yeah, American Legion. Put these little shiny things up. I just joined that. Okay. <laughs> Let us not forget those. Yeah. Who yeah. Serve. yeah the American yeah. Legion <laughs> stickers. <laughs> Okay, so there I can see three more little white flags from where I'm standing. There's one over here. Daniel Hurlbut. Oh, yes. He was an important guy. Uh, he, after the war, was a, uh, a weaver and uh, kept a record book of his sales and his customers. He was also a captain in the militia. You know, there were two two groups of soldiers in the revolution. There was the Continental Army, George Washington's Army, and they were disciplined soldiers. And then there were the militia, a volunteer group that showed up when they felt like it. And it was not particularly disciplined, but he was a captain of the militia. And I guess about two thirds, three quarters of the Wilton men in the revolution were in the militia rather than the Continental Army. Now the Comstocks that I showed you were Continental Army guys, and they made a commitment, stayed in the whole seven years of the war. The militia guys were in and out and in and out. Charles M.B. St. John, 
son of Charles and Nancy uh, of New York City, age 24, lost in the Arctic expedition, September. Well, <laughs> 1855. I don't even know what ship he was on, but he was on an Arctic expedition and never got back. And then over here, I think we have the Marvin family. Yes, Marvin family. A big monument and a lot of graves going that direction. The Marvins, well, the the one house in town that still carries that name is the Marvin Tavern up in front of the high school. And it's owned by the town. It was acquired as part of the property acquisition when they built the high school in 1970. And it's rented out. I think there are a couple of apartments, apartments in there. But uh, the Marvin family, several generations of them, lived in Wilton and the Marvin Tavern was uh, well known during the revolutionary times as a place where the revolutionary officers often stayed. And I even have a letter in the files written by Samuel Parsons, a revolutionary general. And he wrote it while he was staying at the Marvin Tavern. It was addressed to George Washington. And he was reporting on the battles, the battle in Norwalk at that time. So it, it was a well-known revolutionary monument. It's on, the, it's on some historic registers. Where's Allison? Allison, we lost you. <laughs> the Marvin Marvin Tavern. How many historic registers is Marvin Tavern on? At least on yes, it's National Register. Yeah, National yes, it Register. It's on I the National so. Register of Historic Places. Yeah, so that was one of the Marvins, and there are a number of the Marvins here. And where was the tavern? It's still. It still is. It's right in front of the high school. It's that yellow building. That yellow building. Oh, yes. The square right yellow building. Like out of the right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right across yeah. from the line. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. And it dates back to 1760 or thereabouts. Yeah. It was a tavern. Now it's a, uh, divided into two apartments. Yeah. And owned by the town. Owned by the town. Owned by the town. Right. Okay. Ah. This was the, as far as I'm concerned, the most important metal book because he's the one that gave this piece of the cemetery to the Congregational Church in 1818. And he had, he had uh, buried a few church members and other Wilton people before 1818 in his private cemetery. He gave his private cemetery to the church in 1818. And then his uh, family members, the Betts family, were married into the Middlebrooks and they owned the next section which they gave to the church. And then finally, Virginia Middlebrook Atkinson or something like that gave another chunk to the church in 1918 and then it went on to the property they got from the Gregory family. So started all started here because Jonathan Middlebrook. Okay. Somebody's knocked him over. <laughs> or it just fell with Thomas Cole. Now Thomas Cole was in the Revolutionary War and he was wounded in New York City. And his mother rode horse, or maybe she had a buggy, into the city, brought him home to recover. He recovered, lived another 50 years. And his family lived up on the corner of Seely Road and Route 7. It's an old house that says 1719 on the front. Well, it's not really that old, but <laughs> it's a lot newer than that. But Thomas Cole's son, Thomas Jr., joined up with uh, one of the Nichols family and they had a Nichols and Cole uh, carriage mill, carriage factory. It was on the other side, the house that I'm talking about is on the north corner of Seeley and Danbury Road. On the south corner, which is a big open lot owned by the land trust, Nichols and Cole had their carriage factory. And uh, starting in the early 1800s, they were building carriages. It was the first carriage factory in Wilton. And then it turned into some other kind of factory and eventually it burned down, which is what happened to most of the factories in those days. And so the only thing left were a few stones. 
<laughs> but it's still there. And the land, I'm not even quite sure how we got it, but it's a nice open, speed, open yes, spot. Yes, yes. And there's an old barn on the property. Right. I don't know if you've ever been in a barn. I asked, ask, uh, Peter? Yeah, ask Peter Gaborio. He says he's been in it. <laughs> he lives right there. Yeah, and there's nothing in it. <laughs> Dana was involved with carriages. Well, Dana was in the the uh, Universal Joint business. Charles Dana. Yeah, he, he bought the company that made Universal Joints in you know, about 1910 or something. It's kind of important how you transfer power from here to here, and so he got very rich. <laughs> And he came to Wilton, he was a great benefactor for the town. There's a huge marker down at the other end of the cemetery, it says Dana on it. Because he, he owns several plots. But he's not buried there, because his widow didn't want him buried in Wilton. <laughs> so the housekeeper is buried there. <laughs> where is he in Detroit? I don't know where he is. He died in 1975. I never actually met him. I guess he was a very crusty guy. Tom Adams used to tell me about meetings with Dana when they were trying to preserve properties. And he was a very hard guy to deal with, but he had a good relationship with the ministers at the Congregational Church and uh, was a favorite. They loved him because he gave a lot of money to the church, a great supporter of the church and of Norwalk Hospital. Okay, so this is William Wakeman, lived on Seely Road, big house at the corner we make the turn it's all obscured by bushes now I remember 20 some years ago the Resch family lived there uh, there's a son named Ron Resch who was in school with our kids and uh, they had a station on the Underground Railroad and Mr. Wakeman was responsible for that and uh, there is a tunnel a partial tunnel a part of it was filled in and the picture of that in the book the Wilton book uh, that the Wakeman family uh, supported these people who transported slaves who had escaped. They'd have a stop in, in uh, Darien, I think, and then they'd have a stop at the Wakeman house, and then they would transport them farther upstate until eventually, you know, they'd be free. Canada was the ultimate goal. <clears throat> so Wakeman was uh, quite a hero of the, uh, the anti-slavery movement in Wilton. That's not to say we didn't have people that were supporting slavery and didn't want to see it change, because if you go back much earlier than the early Underground Railroad, there was a period in the 1830s when they had uh, preachers come and preach up in Georgetown in a Baptist church uh, about the evils of slavery. And uh, they preached one night in the church they preached the second night in the church, even though there was some rumbling and rioting around it. They were going to preach a third night, but the uh, opponents came in and put a keg of gunpowder in the church and blew it up. Oh. <laughs> in about 1836. Where was that church? It was uh, in, I think I could find it on an old map at Georgetown, but it was, they, they actually rebuilt it and the church oh. maintained for a while. But the Georgetown's been all cut up several times since 1836. <laughs> okay, so we'll turn around and go back over there. I tried to make a, a note on the uh, old section as to where, where it connected to the new section. Van Hooser was a historian in town, and his father was a historian in town, and his grandfather lived his whole life in Wilton. So Van Hooser knew a lot about Wilton and he wrote a lot about Wilton. The trouble is all of his research about Wilton, they covered from the early 1800s up through 1900 and then he stopped writing. And he lived to 1921, but by then he was into other pursuits and he wasn't writing any more Wilton history. But all the work he did is in typewritten form, it was typed up after he died and it's in the history room in the Wilton Library. And that's part of the reason I wrote the book. I said, you got all this stuff Van Hooser did, nobody co ever comes in here and reads it. And if we publish it the way it is, it would be six volumes. And who wants to read six volumes about Wilton? So I said, we'll condense it. <laughs> but the problem was he only went to 1900. 
And so I had a whole hundred years I had to research on my own. But <laughs> we had town records, we had town meetings, we had births and deaths and marriages and, and uh, genealogies that other people had done. Other, uh, other uh, historian after Van Hooser was Evans Hubbard. Hubbard Road in Wilton Center, named for Hubbard because he, he essentially built most of Wilton Center in the 1930s. And right after the war, he built Wilton Arms, which is still a, a rental apartment building. Yeah. That was uh, Evans Hubbard product. And he did a lot of history too. But again, he only went as far as 1900, so <laughs> I had to fill in a lot. But thank heavens for the two of them. They each left volumes and volumes of history that's in typewritten form, which I still refer to because I can find things there that, you know, people ask about. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We can make our way back to the starting point. Uh, you want people to sign this? Yes. Put yes, their please. names yes. on Ellison's oh. keeping score. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 You're welcome.